The brothers wish. The brothers wish, brothers wish. The brothers wish. The brothers. You're West. now listening to Greg, it's the Brothers Wisp. Let's take a ride through space on this mother. Hey everybody, this Why is Greg, and we are back we with another tips video. Day. Today we have the venerable Jim Jones. <laughs> how are you today, sir? Not bad, how about you, Greg? Ah, not so bad. Appreciate it. So where are you out of? We are in Topeka, Kansas. Topeka, Kansas? Well, you're not too... Well, you are far from me. We did a, a competition there one time, like in hot college i think or something like that and it felt like forever we were all crammed into this little compact van and uh you basically had no personal space and uh i felt every minute of that drive so you are a little way it's away. a long one down well what do you do up yeah. there jim well uh currently i am a senior systems engineer for a managed service provider um we work mostly in the title insurance vertical so uh, most of our clients are title insurance companies. Uh, not very exciting. Uh, lots of compliant stuff. Um, so that's what I'm doing today. My background, I started uh, uh, in IT in the early 90s. I started uh, in ISP in 96. Sold it to a regional uh, independent telephone company in 2000. Uh, went to work for them managing their network. Uh, and, um, we rolled out fiber to the home in 2003. Um, so we were, oh, were early ahead of the curve. Yeah, for sure. Very, yeah, very much. So, uh, it's, uh, that, that, um, telephone company is out really in the middle of nowhere. Um, it's between Topeka and Manhattan and they have fiber now to their entire service area, even the, the farm that's five miles south of the interstate that's, you know, just unserved otherwise. That's wild. And it's actual fiber to the home. That's great. <laughs> yeah. So how many customers would you say they have on fiber out there? Uh, they, um, when I left, they were pushing past 5,000. Oh, wow. Uh, now they're moving into Manhattan, Kansas. So they've got, they're hitting the businesses right now in Manhattan. Uh, so that's like their first big city to move into, but yeah, they're doing great. It's, it's great to have that out in the, in the rural area because there are businesses there. It's neat. You drive along highway 24, which is kind of a, uh, you know, uh, a state highway and every, every city that you go through and it's like every 15, 20 miles, there's a little city, uh, they're all drying up. Hmm. Um, except for when you get into the areas that are served by this telephone company, they have such a unique mix of businesses that just shouldn't exist there, but they do because they can hmm. because of their, because of their connectivity. Really? You think uh, it's attributed yeah. directly to the connectivity in that area? Guarantee it. Guarantee wow. it. Having, having worked with those customers to, uh, you know, kind of get the, everything going once the connectivity was there they were able to build their businesses grow and stay in the rural environment they wanted to stay in without um you know without they didn't have to go they didn't have to go somewhere else to to run their business yeah that's phenomenal and you yeah, got to great. be part of that yeah it was fun a lot of fun yeah i still get to hook up with those guys every now and then uh they're we have uh, we have some of our customers at the MSP that are their customers, so we're you know constantly still back and forth, and that's good. That's good. Would you ever now and then just walk up and say you're welcome, and then just walk away? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no. It was a team effort. <laughs> <laughs> for sure, for sure. Well, that's cool. So you're coming from an MSP slant, although your pedigree is is ISP, obviously. So. Yep. Um, you talked about compliance and stuff a little bit like that. And I, I think um, as far as listenership goes, we are getting more enterprise listeners, right? So MicroTix yeah. sort of breaking into the enterprise market and just its abilities to, um, I guess, connect. Now, I mean, you know, I think their Wi-Fi is really good inside. So a lot of people are using it for that or uh, their switching line is starting to get a little bit more robust. So I think we'll see them make inroads there as well. Um so it's interesting. I, I'm, I'm curious to hear whatever pops in your head from your perspective. But let's start with your number one. 
and I like your number one a lot. You say, show up. Heck yeah. It doesn't take a lot of skill or talent to do that. <laughs> sometimes, I don't know, sometimes it seems like it takes a lot to find somebody who will just show up every time. It does. Uh, it, it, that's, that's no understatement. Um, uh, we're lucky to have a really good crew here. There's not a lot of problems with that, but over the years I've seen, um, other companies struggle with it. Uh, different people here and there struggle with it. And it's, it's, um, if, if you can just, if you can just show up and pay attention, you know, if you're getting started in it, listen, talk to people, hang out, uh, and this will probably bubble over into some of the other tips. Talk to people who don't do what you do, you know, and just, so it's not just about showing up to work. It's showing up to any opportunity you have to, um, you know, just to learn more. For sure. And you saying not just from um, a perspective of I'm an employee at a company, but also, you know, when you're going to meet a client, right? Heck yeah. Uh, that's especially true. If you're, if you have, if you have a time and date set with, um, with a client and you're late, that looks bad for you. It looks bad for the company you're representing. And, uh, there's, there's really nothing more frustrating than that. Um, I, I get frustrated when people are late to appointments that I have set with them. Um, especially dentists or doctors, <laughs> you know, if you're late and they cancel your appointment because you're late, they'll bill you for that time. Mm. Right. Um, but I bill for more than some of these doctors. <laughs> So the last dentist that did that, I threatened to bill them for my time every time they made me wait in the in the waiting room. <laughs> um, because it's true. I mean, it's just, look, um, they, well, I, I wrote this in the notes here. It's a, it's a quote from my dad uh, years ago. He said, if you're early, you're on time. If you're on time, you're late. And if you're late, you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it, you know, it, it goes with everything. I mean, it's just... Um, it's important. It's really, really important. For sure. Somebody articulated it this way to me. It said, um, they said, if you set an appointment for something and you show up late, you're basically telling the other person that your time's more valuable than yours. It's and disrespectful. It absolutely is. And, yep. Yep. you know, everybody's human. Things come up, but you can uh, communicate that transparently, right? You can reach yep. out to them. You can call them. You can send them a text. You can do anything and let them just give them a heads up, right? Don't just exactly. no call, no show. That's kind of the worst thing ever. Indeed. Um, especially in front of a client. You're right. I try and always make sure to get there sometimes like 20 minutes early if I can. And I'll hang out in the parking lot and check my phone for a minute, you know, catch up on emails and then walk in if I need to. Yeah. So yep. that I don't look like I'm too crazy early. But, um, you know, you're going to hit traffic. There's going to be accidents. There's going to be all kinds of stuff. Yep, Exactly. Yep. Be prepared. Be on time. I like that one a lot. That's just, um, that's basic courtesy. You know, it's like saying please and thank you. You know, it is. Yeah. It has nothing to do with technology, but there it is. Yeah, for sure. It's, yeah. uh, it's lost to, uh, I mean, I think everybody says this new generation is lost on them. Uh, probably right. every generation that came before them says the same thing, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've seen some youngsters that have problems with that. <laughs> I, uh, particularly, I had a nephew of mine who did an internship with us up at the data center and every morning I would have to wake him up. And I remember one morning I, uh, I woke him up and I said, all right, stand up. And so he stood up and then I, I went about my regular whatever, and then got to the office and then he still showed, showed up late. Apparently he sat back down and fell asleep. So <laughs> asleep. <laughs> my dad always used to yell at me when I was a kid. He's like, look, all you have to do is get out of bed. If you can get past that, you'll be okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> From what I understand, he's, uh, he's an adult in the real world now and he's gotten a handle on that. I hope. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, he doesn't have somebody to roll him out of bed every morning. Although That's right. uh, he's getting married soon. So I guess he will have somebody to roll him out of bed. <laughs> uh, let's yeah. See. Yeah. With that. That kind of responsibility, you don't have much of a choice. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Now he's accountable to two people instead of just one. That's right. Uh, let's see. Your number two says no DNS. So this is very IT specific. It is. Um, I when I got started in IT, I had uh, the great fortune of um, having a guy that understood the importance of DNS, um, and he banged that into my head 
that if you don't have your head around this, you're going to struggle throughout everything. And I'm not talking about like any really deep, um, deep, uh, all the details of everything to do with DNS or how the protocol works or, but you have to have some understanding of DNS. Um, the more you have, the better, um, especially if you're in our line of work, uh, you do really have to have a better understanding of, of all the details. But when it comes to, uh, dealing with, with, um, vendors that are, um, web hosting companies or, um, marketing people, and they try to yank the DNS away from uh, from our clients. You know, we may host the, D- the DNS for our clients. We're doing a lot with the DNS. It's not just there for their www record, right? Um, and this marketing company talks the owner of the company into giving control of the DNS. They pull it away. Uh, all of a sudden, our zone is a lame zone. And they've got a new zone sitting out at GoDaddy with a single record in it where we had 40. <laughs> Their email doesn't work. Uh, nothing works anymore, you know. Uh, all of the stuff that they have tied into whatever other web services they have running, it's all just dead. And and these people who are, um, and I'm maybe picking on them a little bit, but the marketing people, the, uh, uh, the uh, um web design kind of people, all um, developers even, they should know, and they don't, and something like that happens, and it's terrible. So if you just get your head around the basics of DNS, you're going to avoid those kind of problems. Um, And then when it comes to actually hosting it, like we do, um, understanding the importance of availability, um, whether we're talking about inside or outside DNS, it's, you know, you just really have to have a good handle on that. So if you guys host DNS for customers, how do you manage changes? Do you have a portal that they can go in and, and make adjustments to it, or do they submit a ticket and you make the change? Or Yeah, they submit a ticket, and we change it for them. Okay. Uh, so just... we have we have a web portal that we use. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, we don't let them do the... Uh, you don't let them make uh, make <laughs> arbitrary changes to their zones. No, absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> well, we've had we've had um, some sister companies of ours that we uh, we give them limited access to make adjustments on their zones, but um, in the firewall, you know, we can we can limit who actually has access to reach that stuff. So it's really critical <laughs> infrastructure like that that I always worry about opening up to the internet, sort of thing, you know. So it. It's always, I'm always curious how people do that. I always feel so much better when I can kind of air gap that stuff. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, Also, most of our customers don't know or want to know about any of that. Yeah. So in our line of business, we don't, uh, we have, we have a handful of clients that do have some IT staff, um, but even then they don't want to deal with it. So we, you know, we prefer to, and it works out well. For sure. I mean, um, generally, if you're utilizing an MSP, you want to pile as much on top of those guys as you can. So uh, I totally get that. Yeah, no doubt. All right. Number three, be humble, ask for help. Yeah. Yeah, I've been doing this a long time, um, and I ask for help every day. Um, There was a time when I didn't ask for help a lot, um, and... I think I made most of my mistakes during that time, uh, you know, because I thought I knew. Um, I uh, I see people all the time um, with that kind of attitude, um, and it's it's scary, you know, just to think that that's normal. Um, a friend of mine is uh, is looking for a job and. He's he closed his office. He's looking for work, and he's worried that he's going to show up at a new job, and because he doesn't know the new company's infrastructure inside and out, and he's going to ask a lot of questions, and he's going to look like an idiot. You know, it's like, well, no. Um, especially you know, in, in a situation like this, we've got a handful of engineers on staff, uh, a big help desk. Um, we're always asking each other for help, and you shouldn't be ashamed to do that. When it comes to the, so that's internal kind of uh, inside work. 
when it comes to uh, dealing with vendors and, and software, we see that a lot here where we're supporting our customers' line of business applications and, um, you know, our, our people who support that, that software will, will spend way too much time trying to figure out for themselves instead of just open a ticket. They're paying for support for that line of business software. Use the support. Um, and a lot of times, because it's us being an IT company, them being a software company, um, it's not like a consumer calling for support. Mm -hmm. you, know, you get in, you talk to the right people, and it's really good support. But we shy away from that because we want to figure it out for ourselves. It's inefficient. <laughs> Well, I think and, I'd like some people to do at least the basics, right? You know, yeah, of course. Is your is your computer still plugged in the wall? You know, you <laughs> you run through the basics, but then yeah, absolutely. You know, if if there's a support person and they're in that position and that is their job, you calling them helps them justify being employed with that company, right? So you exactly believe it or not, a lot of these folks get measured on these metrics, and you calling in, even if it's a simple thing, kind of helps them justify their existence and. Yeah, get their numbers no up. So it's it's good all the way around. But yeah. the idea of being humble um, struck me yesterday as I was talking to this guy. So we're not an MSP um, in general by any sense of the imagination, you know. So my um, Fibertown day job data center, it's a co-location facility, and that's mostly what we focus on is is racking and stacking and being an ISP, right? So right. we had a guy come in who has this. Um, very special request. I'm going to get into it, but he had a very special request and it, the way he was trying to engineer things was very bizarre because he's trying to do this very specific thing with a piece of hardware. Um, it's like this special hardware appliance he's made. And he started through this process, like getting combative, you know, and he was telling me, you know, I've been in the IT industry for 40 years and I always run into these problems with network guys and blah, blah, blah. And I was, you know, and so I, I let him, I let him finish. And then I said, look, it's, I'm not questioning what you're trying to do. Um, I, I think it's an interesting concept and I would like to bring it to fruition, but I don't know that I have the required skills to accomplish what you're asking me to do. Right. And, and in earnest, I don't think what you're asking me to do is possible. I think it's going to fail in this scenario and I would don't want to I would never want to tell you I can do something if I don't think it would be successful at the end of it, right? And so he instantly flipped, right? So I guess he thought I was attacking him and saying he was dumb or something. But, it, you know, I just told him, hey, I think I'm the one who's too dumb to make this thing work the way you want it to. Um, so I don't know. It's so funny that, um, yeah, just being humble completely 180'd that guy's attitude. And at the end of it, he was, I was like, I'm not sure that we can really do this for you. And he was like, no, you can do it. You totally can do it. And you know, it's just, it's, it's so funny how that works. But I, I think you just basically relayed my life story. I was the same way, chip on my shoulder and I didn't need anybody to tell me how to do yep. it. And I isolated yep. myself until, you know, I wanted to be the guy at the top and then you get to the top and man, is that lonely. Um, yes, it is. When you put yourself out there on that island. So I, man, I'm. Uh, a definite believer in this and, and something, yeah, Nick said was always be the dumbest guy in the room. And I, I fully embrace that now. I love being the dumbest guy <laughs> whenever possible. No doubt. But I love that. That's, that's so good. Don't take too long to call support. That's what I always tell people is that that's what we're here for. You know, we're, and, and the approach we take is it's always our problem until you tell it's, tell us it's not your problem, right? And I think that's very inviting for people because whenever you usually call a carrier, what's the first thing they say? You know, we don't see anything. Everything looks not our problem. Yeah. 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 Everything's fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's cool that yep. you're actually telling people, hey, we're your support. Use us. I like that. That's right. Yep. It's good. Um, I had a similar situation recently, just an encounter with a client um, where there was um, a bit of a um, cultural difference and language barrier. Um, and the whole thing started out seeming, like you said, very combative. Um, and as it turned out, it was really just lost in translation. And once everybody sat down and said, hey, you know, this is where we are, this is, you know, and just stopped 
acting like you know everybody's the the biggest guy in the room eh, it uh it started going a lot better yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. for sure your ego rarely does you any favors in those scenarios yep it's true yeah especially when you're dealing with a client right what's the what's the favorite everybody's favorite thing to talk about is themselves right so you don't make it about you you make it about them and you give them a platform to talk and you know everything goes smooth yep lots of active listening and lots of um lots of not talking about what you're going to do to fix it but how they're going to see a difference and you know just yeah put it back on them oh man. make it about them oh you said all the right words there that's uh that's some, <laughs> that's hard-earned hard-earned wisdom right there <laughs> you don't just happen yeah. upon that hmm so I'm looking at your number four, back up all the things. I think Thomas would agree with you on that. You know, I love Unimus. Um, uh, I started out using it when he put it out there um, uh, as a beta. We're not heavy Microtik users, and I want to touch on that with regards to the uh, the enterprise thing we were talking about before, but um, maybe later. The... Um, <clears throat> When I when he released the beta, I got him access to some of the devices that we use. Um, so he had support already for normal Cisco stuff, but we use a lot of the Cisco small business switches, and it's kind of like iOS, but not really. You know, it's a kind of a very watered down iOS, and it didn't work with you know. Uh, with Unimus as being recognized as a standard piece of Cisco gear. Um, so now we've got it deployed all over the place. We've got Unimus everywhere hitting all of our stuff, and it's just, it's a lifesaver. Yeah. Yeah, I love how um, um, but streamlined it's gotten. Like, the install process is so smooth on it now. It is. Uh, the upgrades, I just upgraded uh, several installations. Um I was anxious to get the dark mode. Uh, thanks for that. <laughs> and uh, the um, the the inline uh, diffs. So it was line per line diff before. Now you get diffs inline. Uh, is fantastic. Um, yeah, it's just it's great software all around. Prior to that, um, at uh, a couple companies ago, um, one of my guys um, spun up Rancid. And we used Rancid to do config backups, but that is much like its name suggests, really bad. <laughs> um, and uh, when when I came here and started in this MSP world, and I've been here going on five years now, um, there's you know I just I just couldn't find a way to make Rancid work well, uh, the way that uh, the way that Thomas has it with. Um, the licensing where you can take a license key for a specific number of devices and just you know kind of peel that off and put it everywhere. It, it works really well, and the install is just so daggum simple. Mm. Like I said, it's it's great. Um, but um, that's that part. The configurations of your network are are the things that I think they're overlooked the most when IT people start talking about doing backups and talking about disaster recovery and business continuity. They talk about backing up servers. They talk about, you know, um, file data, if it's on workstations that are particularly important. Um, DR using, you know, really cool technologies like Zerto or Veeam. All of that stuff is just kind of normal. Everybody talks about that. But so many people just forget the underpinnings of your network. You've got to back up that infrastructure. And um, there's no easier way to do it. So... Yeah. yeah. It's so funny yeah. how a lot of things hinge on that one switch that's been running for five years, right? With no problems until the one time that it gets a little surge or it reboots and its configuration is completely gone. And yeah, yeah, it's the worst, but you're also talking about backup all the things you're talking about, uh, as an MSP, you're talking about server infrastructure too, right? For sure. Um, we we uh, focus heavily on making sure that all the actual systems are backed up. Uh, we do block level uh, backups on everything. Um, we uh, preach the difference between backup and DR. A lot of people just think that it's all kind of the same. Um, so 
when it comes to um, you know making sure that a, a, com a company can uh, withstand some kind of outage, you know, there's a lot of extra cost involved in doing that, and they have to weigh. Is it worth paying all that extra money for? Is it not? Do we just rely on backups or do we really need a good DR plan? So we we actually we're um, all of our stuff DR is down to Dallas, um, so it's beyond the 220 mile NIST recommendation, and uh, it's uh, it's good. It's um, we use Zerto, so our our uh, VMs are down to like uh, six six to ten second. Uh, uh, RPOs. Um, it's crazy. I mean, it's it, we can push a button, have an environment up and running in the remote data center in about five minutes with a loss of six to ten seconds worth of data. That's intense. <laughs> it is. And I, we're not talking about a lot of bandwidth either. I think the, these sites are running on big pipes uh, between the data centers. So That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. Yeah. That's something that uh, I think a lot of folks, especially in um, kind of the smaller environments that they forget about, right? They're they're so busy just trying to put out fires that once they stand something up, they just walk away. Okay, it's working and they walk away and they forget about the survivability of that system. Something we talk about too is, I mean, there's a lot of buzzwords where right? like concurrent maintainability, right? Not just that I've got tapes on the shelf with that storage on there but if this server completely fails this virtual machine this hypervisor whatever it happens to be how long does it take me to get everything back up and functioning in a normal fashion right and so a lot of people don't actually calculate how long that's going to take them right something i was talking to somebody the other day about was they were talking about this doctor's office who um he did imaging so he had two mri machines and uh, from what this guy was telling me, whenever you get an MRI machine, you have to put a UPS on it because if it ever loses power, it voids the warranty on that machine. And so this guy, he did that. He followed the procedures. He got a UPS, but he put it out in the parking lot, right? It was separate from his building. And he had one four inch conduit going in between the two. Well, a hurricane came along and knocked over a pine tree and it cut that piece of conduit. So his two machines lost power. They were fine, but they lost power which avoided the warranty, which he couldn't get uh, repaired in time. So his business went under, believe it or not. Wow. Yeah. So yeah. concurrent maintainability. What happens if this one cable gets cut? How could that impact me? Right. And so some people don't realize it could actually um, be the fail. So there's an electrician I know who's doing very successful uh, or becoming very successful. He's opened a second location in another town and he had all of his QuickBooks on one server that wasn't being backed up, wasn't replicating anywhere. And uh, he apparently had, I guess, a RAID array on there and lost one drive and never knew it. And it was making weird noises, but he was like, yeah, I'll, I'll look at it in the morning. Well, he came back in the morning and his uh, other RAID drive had failed. So it was just completely, he was just completely dead in the water. And he was like, I can't quote, I can't do my taxes, I can't do anything. He had to rush it up to Houston, and he was able to get it recovered enough. But it's it's those simple things. You know, if, if, if a system is the center of your universe, you really need to have some kind of uh, replication, something that you can actually test, right? Yeah, no doubt. We had a client that we uh, recently onboarded that... Um, it was still just like within a week or so of onboarding, one of their servers died. So we hadn't gotten to the point where we went through all the servers and checked everything. And, mm. you know, we, we just brought these guys on and one of the hard drives died. And the previous MSP had set up their uh, file server with, you know, array, array level zero. Mm. Stripe, no parity. <laughs> <laughs> yep, lost it all. Oh my god! Uh, we we did we did have backups. The very first thing we do when we take a client on is we we back up everything, and um, so we were able to recover. But you know, you you have to be sure you know what you're doing when it comes to deploying those kind of technologies because you know the default option must have just been JBOD, so that's what he did. Just a bunch of this, and that's you know, no backup system is successful until you test it. 
right you know you actually have to test those things and um we put it on the schedule to do it and i have to say if i didn't have help it would probably never get tested yeah because one thing i hate doing it and two we just get so busy sometimes no doubt uh with the way well so here's the thing um it kind of goes along with getting help uh when you when you know what your core competencies are and you're very good at those things and if if you have things that fall outside of those or not even core competencies but um things that you just don't have the time to keep up with you know if you can farm that kind of stuff out and still be confident in the quality of the work and and the service provided um your business will grow faster Hmm. right you might pay a little more for it but honestly you know you'll be able to spend your time doing what you're good at uh, we we were doing all of our uh, DR stuff in house up until um, early this year, and we started uh, farming out our disaster recovery part to a nationwide uh, company that does that sort of thing. And so we don't have to maintain the DR infrastructure anymore. Um, they take care of scheduling the tests, and when it's a third party that's putting something on your calendar you have to do these tests. There's no, you know, well, I'll put that off because it's just me, right? You're accountable to, you know, to somebody else's time. Yeah. So, yeah. I like it. I like it. I like it. Yep. All right. Number five, don't be married to vendors. Use the right tool for the job. Yeah. So this is where, um, this is where our approach to, uh, to gear, comes probably a little bit differently than a lot of other MSPs that I've come in contact with. A lot of them will be, and maybe they're they're not specifically MSPs, maybe they're called VARs, uh, people whose main focus is sales. Hmm. Um, and so, uh, and usually those are more regional or, or national companies. Uh, they, they push Cisco, they push HP, you know, all the big names. These are going to be guys that are um, like gold partners or platinum partners, right? Right, exactly. Um, and nobody ever got fired for buying IBM. Isn't that the, the saying from way back when? Now it's nobody ever got fired for buying Cisco. Yeah. Well, except for Cisco's got as many issues as anybody else. Yep. Uh, and their prices aren't, I mean, it's just hard to justify when you know the difference. When you don't know the difference, it's easy to say, I'm going to stay with this. I know it. I've got the support for it. I've got, you know, two hour or four hour um, replacement. You're not going to get two hour or four hour replacement with Microtech. Um, but you could sure buy a bunch of cold spares for the cost of that smart net agreement. <laughs> yeah, you could. <laughs> uh, but um, so we, we take a little bit different approach. We, we don't go with the, you know, the very expensive solutions. Um, our, our standard, uh, stack that we deploy to our customers involves a watch guard firewall, um, which works well for us because we've got a great, uh, central management system for that. Um, and, uh, and it, it provides all of the next gen firewall things that we need, the reporting things that we need for our customers that need the compliance stuff. Compliance, there you go. Uh, and, um. So uh, there's the WatchGuard firewall. We use the Cisco small business uh, switches, which are very capable. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed the last uh, episode where you guys were talking about uh, stacking versus uh, the uh, the multi uh, chassis lag. Um, so we use uh, here and there. We use stacking in um, with some of these small business switches, and it's great, uh, especially on uh, you know an edge network where you're just, you know, an access network where you're just pushing out to all the endpoints. But there's a couple of places that I that I think that we're using stacking that I have on my list now to go undo that <laughs> um, after that episode. <laughs> well, maybe we shouldn't be doing that. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, so we, we have one client that we just brought on that uses Brocade throughout the whole network. And... Um, you know, we're talking about uh, the idea of uh, switching those out for ones that fit with our way of doing things. Um, one of the things that makes it uh, makes us successful is to be able to provide a very cookie cutter approach to right. everything. 
we still make we still um, allow for changes where it is necessary to fit the client's needs, right? We can't be so firm on our cookie cutter that um, you know this this client over here that is a zoo has to operate exactly like this client over here that's a title company. Right. It doesn't work. Um, but if we can if we can deploy the same set of hardware everywhere, then when it comes to training internally, when it comes to uh, speed of troubleshooting, all of that, it's great. Yeah, yeah. So uh, this one client just um, deployed a bunch of brocades um, in the last couple of years and spent way too much money on it. Um, you know, so we've got on the list for, you know, hopefully someday moving those out to um, to the Cisco small business stuff. Yeah. Um, in bringing them on, though, I've uh, I've seen some of the things that Brocade is doing with their switches, the ICX line, and they're fantastic. But for the way that they're using them, I couldn't justify the price. Mm. Um, so I know that there's a right there's a right tool for the job, and if you're if you're not doing all of these fancy things, um, then you could spend a fraction of the money. Uh, you know, getting something that does just as good. Um, and the other concern I have with brocade is just who are they going to be tomorrow? Um, you know, they're a different company every other day since the last. Yeah. It seems like it. Cause they, what did they yeah. acquired foundry and then immediately sold off a bunch of those assets and, uh, then they get Aruba and then sell that. Aruba. Off? Yeah. Um, and, uh, Geez, there was another one that was just in there. I don't know, it's always something. But you were uh, like you were talking yeah. about with the repeatability, um, the cookie cutter approach. You know, that, that's like a, that's like a franchise. It's like a McDonald's, right? It's like it you, know, you do the same thing every time. We've we've written the playbook already. We know all the things we can expect from this equipment, these scenarios, um, and it makes uh, speed of deployment so much faster too. You know, you don't have to and, reinvent the wheel every single time. And troubleshooting, you know, um, when when you've got we've got uh, five or six people on our help desk and a handful of engineers. If we're all dealing with different brands and different models and everything, it's just it's hard to deal with. When it comes to deployment, um, human error, um, having the same gear all the time, um, you're not you know mixing things up in your head um, with tools like Unimus. You know, it makes it so easy just to have your uh, your stuff that you push out to your devices, either for auditing or for config changes, um, and not having to rewrite every time you got a new kind of device you're pushing out there. It's good stuff. That's awesome. So uh, you yeah. mentioned compliance, and so I think a lot of guys listening to this probably don't even know what you're talking about. So, what do you mean when you say compliance for some customers? So um, there are, we're um, SOC 2 type 2 compliant. We get audited um, twice a year. Um, the auditors can pull from any point in time, uh, not just within the audit period. Um, and what they're checking against is what our uh, stated standards are. And so we have to have a book that says this is the way we do things. And so what they audit against is every point in that book to see if we're doing what we say we do against all of our clients. Um, and so uh, this the difference between SOC 2 uh, Type 2 and SOC 2 Type 1 is that with SOC 2 Type 2, they can go back in time and at any point in the past to do the audit. Um, I, I think it's in the past six months where SOC 2 Type 1 is we're going to designate a start date for your audit and an end date for your audit, and that's the only time that we can audit you against. Um, so we have to be compliant all the time. We have to be sure that every uh, policy and procedure we put in place is done for all of our clients. Um, and uh, not all of our clients. All of our clients that pay us for being compliant right because so we have some clients that aren't i was gonna say like so right. the data center we're um we get audited as well we do all those things 
And the only reason we do that, one is, is to prove that, you know, we do what we say we do and we follow our own, we eat our own dog food sort of thing, right? We, we right. say we're going to do it, yep. so we do it. But it's also because these guys are getting audited. And if we can hand them our audit that says all of these things are already completed, it makes their life so much easier, right? And so that's going to be people that have what, like um, healthcare with HIPAA compliance or yep. uh, law enforcement with CGIS. And I mean, there's... There's a million different sort of compliances you might have to adhere to. And um, uh, each one of them has their own variations, their own requirements, their own uh, amount of logging. And, you know, what's funny is, too, is we've looked at some of those various compliances those guys have to follow. And some of it's kind of a gray area. You know, there's not some of it's sort of, you know, it's like you need to retain logs, but it doesn't always say how much. Uh, logging to what logging level and you know and it's sort of I think what do they say something like to um, to an expected average for somebody right. in your position or something like that right so the average yeah. person in your position would do this much and so it's it's so funny how, how you can be audited over things that are sort of a gray area which we don't have to be audited like they do but uh, that would be yeah, very much so we, we've had some situations with um, cyber security uh, breaches where um, the lawyers get involved and they start talking about what um, what uh, is expected, what the, the kind of common expected thing is. And as long as you're doing just that, then, you know, you have to, I forget the name for it, but um, it is, it's very gray. It's like, what does that mean exactly? Well, it means whatever you want it to. When it comes to compliance stuff, when we run into issues like that and we're not sure um, how that needs to be done, we write the specifics in our book, in our policies, and then we've defined those specifics. And that works for, for the type of compliance that we're after. It may not work for HIPAA. It may not work for PCI or anything else. But for the kind of stuff that we're doing, if we've got kind of that kind of that gray area, as long as we define it and follow what we've defined, we're good. Right, 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 right. Yeah. We'll do what we say we're going to do. Right. All right. So let's see. We've got a little bonus material in here. We do. <laughs> bonus we number do. one. Um, it says learn. I, I couldn't. That's right. I couldn't I couldn't narrow it down to just five. In fact, I think I added these after the fact. And then I was like, which one do I replace? Um <laughs> So I spent um, I spent 13 years working at this uh, telephone company after they bought my ISP. I was given the opportunity to have them pay for my education, and I didn't take them up on it. It was part of the benefit package. They they pay for any college stuff, and I thought eh, I'm not going to have the company that I'm working for pay for something that I'm just going to use to leave them. Um, and that that was. I guess specifically interesting for me because I don't have a college degree. I don't have a high school diploma either. Um, but uh, that's a different story for a different time. <laughs> um, but uh, I spent that whole 13 years doing a lot of very cutting edge stuff, working on very cool things. Um, but I didn't spend enough time in that whole 13 years uh, learning outside of my, outside of my box. Um, so, um, what I've learned in the last, um, probably just, I've implemented, implemented this in the last, oh, six or seven years where I listen to podcasts all the time that are outside of the area of what I work in. Hmm. Um, Brothers Wisp is always interesting to me because I come from an ISP background. I've edged out using, uh, wireless before. Um, I, I, I love that industry. Uh, but we also, there's a lot of, uh, crossover with the way that we do things where we don't buy the very expensive, like we talked about before we use Cisco small business, we use Unify. Um, and, uh, anyway, so I love listening to this podcast, but then the, uh, other podcasts I listen to that talk about, um, all kinds of, uh, technology that are just outside of, outside of my box. I'm, I'm an infrastructure guy. And um, so I listen to ones about develop, software development, software engineering. Um, I listen to uh, ones about large data center kind of work, um, 
like large Facebook size data center kind of work, um, what they're doing with all the white box stuff. Um, and in, in having that constant discussion um, running through my head, listening to other people talk about this stuff, I'm understanding where they're coming from, what, uh, what problems they are solving, what the solutions are, how that might fit into what I do every day. Um, a lot of times it doesn't, but, you know, it prepares me for those discussions that come that, you know, we get the next client that's bigger than we're used to. Well, here's some things that we can do to fix that. Um, so, yeah, uh, I really push people to um, listen to podcasts, um, audiobooks, uh, if, if they're not big readers. Um, I don't have a lot of time to read. Um, I work, you know, eight, 10 hours a day. I go home, I've got eight kids, um, and I don't have a lot of time to sit around and, and read at home. Uh, when I do sit down and try to read, I fall asleep. <laughs> um, so thankfully, I've got a, a 40 minute commute each way. So I fit in a lot of content, audio books and podcasts doing that. Um, I, uh, there are some things that are only on YouTube that I do I, I turn my phone around and it's things so I can listen to it. I, you know, the temptation to watch it would be too great, but I do listen to YouTube on the road. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, I recommend people try to find things they can listen to outside of their normal day-to-day -day thing, uh, just so that we can, um, you know, just so they can converse better. Uh, in particular, there's one, I guess, one podcast that I'd like to throw out there for people to listen to or, or look up. It's called The Full Stack Journey uh, by Scott Lowe, and he talks about um, career-wise how people go from, um, uh, you know, their infrastructure jobs or standard just IT jobs that they grew up in to where are they going today, and uh, it deals with how, you know, all these different silos are breaking down and you have to be able to communicate with people who aren't like you anymore. And you have to start learning to code, even if it's not uh, large applications, it's scripting, it's automation, it's all this other stuff. Um, and, you know, I can, I can preach about that all day, but I don't eat that dog food. <laughs> I, I, I don't code. I, I don't script. Um, I leave that up to other people. I, I've tried my hand at that, but uh, I've got this little OCD thing going on that if it's not perfect, it's it drives me nuts. So I just I cut that off. Um, <laughs> yeah, you'd never be a good programmer but, then. <laughs> this, no, this thing is perfect. No, <laughs> no. Um, I go for the short wins with networking. It's fantastic. <laughs> um, anyway, so yeah, uh, learn outside of your comfort zone. That's interesting. Well, you say a perfectionist. I think I think doing things. Um, and yeah, like if you learn to program, you would you would work yourself out of that perfectionist thing, you know, because sometimes I think so. You just have to get it done, or you know, when you're in like triage situations, right, where ten things are on fire, then your perfectionism kind of tends to go out the window because you've really got to, you know, I mean, you've got to put all this stuff back together. You got to reassemble Humpty Dumpty. Yep. And you can't do it slowly. So um, I, I like the idea yeah. of listening outside of your. Um, your core competency. I, I really like that. Actually, I've started um, venturing even over to kind of um, managerial stuff. There's one called um, Golly, what's that? What's that podcast? I got to look it up really quick. But it's um, Manager Tools. That's what it's called, Manager Tools. And so it's quick little like 20 minute uh, blurbs from these guys. This guy's got an amazing radio voice. You know, it's just like super deep. Um, but he talks about stuff um, that if you've never had to manage large groups of people, or if you have been managing large groups of people, it, these are better ways to do the things you've always done. You know, things like uh, what happens when an employee asks you for a raise. He gives you very measured, tangible things to, to follow, right? Whereas before, one, you never want to be surprised by it, right? You always want to have a plan together. But two, it's if you've got something structured for people to follow there's comfort in that right if you if you just kind of say vaguely well if you do a good job and you do you know you know what I mean it's like people need structured measured attainable goals that they can reach and, and so they they give you those sorts of things and 
Um, it's so funny because I'll listen to these and they're supposed to be you with your employee, but nine times out of 10, I apply it to my children as well. Right. Like yeah, the way, no the way I look at my kids, one in <clears throat> particular that I learned from here is they were talking about when you're dealing with your employees, um, never talk to them with frustration. Right. So never, never react to them out of, if you can help it, right. We're all human, but if you can help it, never do that because they said your role power as their manager, plus your frustration equals anger. So to that employee, you're mad at them. You're angry and it's going to make them, you know what I mean? It's just going to make the situation worse, wherein you're really just frustrated. There's zero malice, zero right. anger. And the instant yeah. I heard that, I thought, oh my God, my kids think I'm mad at them. You know, right. when you've told them exactly. 20 times to brush their teeth and they just won't do it, you know, it's, right. I, and so I, that night I sit down with my kids and I had this conversation they go, yeah, you get mad at us. And I was like, no, I don't. <laughs> oh my gosh. So I, yeah. I don't know. It, I get frustrated and I'm passionate in my, in my telling you yeah. to do the things that are good for you. Over and over and over. Don't yeah. drink the bleach. I shouldn't have to yell at you about this. You know what I mean? It's, <laughs> it's, it's just, it's so funny how how these things you listen to about being a better manager all of a sudden becomes applicable and makes you a better father to your children, right? It's just listening outside of your core competency can enrich your life in so many different areas. And, and I'm, I'm a firm believer in, um, it doesn't matter what jobs you've had in the past. They've, you can pull something from it. If you've ever been a waiter, you've learned patience with angry people. Right. You know, yeah. or, or a uh, good customer service. As far as that goes, if you ever had to make cold calls to people, you know how to get over your fear of talking to completion. You know what I mean? It's like, so there's everything you can do, everything you can put your hand in, everything you can try. And like you said, push yourself out of your comfort zone is applicable to your life. You may not be right this moment, but it might be tomorrow or the next day. Right. And, yeah. um, something I heard, have you ever watched that free solo movie with that crazy guy that climbs El Capitan with no ropes. It's pretty bonito. No. But in that, in that, it's, I guess it was a documentary, but in that documentary, um, this guy says, uh, you know, he said, uh, people often ask me, how do I, how do I climb these structures without a rope? Right? Because if I slip, I die. I mean, and that's the honest truth. He said, uh, they ask him, you know, how do you deal with that fear? How do you, you know, are you white knuckling it the whole way? And he said, no, what he does is he practices it over and over repetition and he says he expands his comfort zone so instead of dealing with fear he just makes that part of his comfort zone i thought that was so brilliant that was like yeah. just the idea of that was so transformative for me so it's you're talking about you know go outside your comfort zone not just go outside but expand your comfort zone right learn to right. encompass these Be things comfortable in those things yeah yeah, yeah. Exactly. Well, and you know, like you said, with the business stuff, I, I, I probably spend most of my audio book time listening to business related books, uh, podcasts, technical, um, there aren't a lot of audio books that, that play in the technical world because you need, they get outdated too quickly. Yeah. And you need diagrams right. and stuff, right? Right. Right. Um, and so, um, I, I go back and forth between listening to an audio book, then a week or two of catching up on podcasts and an audio book, then back and forth. But, um, the, the thing you said about, uh, your kids, it's, it's amazing because, um, you know, the, the one audio book that I think everybody should read or, or even if it's just a book, but, um, you know, how to win friends and influence people, Dale Carnegie, right. Best book in the world. <laughs> um, and, uh, that, and, and I grew up, uh, listening to a bunch of sales stuff for whatever reason. And, uh, Zig Ziglar and all those guys that are kind of the classics. I went to a, a seminar about um, about some child rearing stuff. It was called, uh, um, geez, I don't even remember what it was called. But I'm sitting here listening to these guys talk about how to deal with your kids and how to you know work with empathy and all this other stuff. And um, I'm thinking they just rewrote all of the classics for your kids. It's the same thing. And whether you're dealing with, with employees or kids or just peers, it all just boils down to we're all just people, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And yeah, in the end, it all just kind of 
mushes together into one thing. But yeah, you're right. It's it's something. Yeah, as far as all of the executive development books I've listened to, they basically say if you're a manager, remember that your people are human and don't be a jerk. And if you are a jerk, apologize. That's basically the, the three tenets so, that they always tell you. It's like, yeah, they're just if you screw up, say you're sorry. And remember yep. that they have a whole thing. They have a whole life going on um, that you don't know about, right? That yep. everybody brings to work with them. Well, and the, that whole not showing anger and, and not having knee jerk reactions and all of that other stuff. I, um, it's, I guess I've never been in a situation where any, any of my bosses were that way, except for my last job. Anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I've never been in any situations where there's ever really any need for those kinds of responses. And while at this current position, there aren't a lot of needs for those kinds of responses, it's it's neat to see my my uh, my boss deals with that kind of stuff. Like, I, I mean, I wish I could deal with my kids as smoothly as he does with, with all of us. It's just so neat to see somebody who's good at that pull it off. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. There's... um. There's this thing called the disc profile. It's supposed to yeah, categorize. Yeah. So um, I can't 100% remember what mine is, but um, I'm basically right in the middle of the bullseye. And so it says that I, one of the things in my report said that I manipulate people to meet my end goals. And I always <laughs> hated that line in there because of the word manipulate, it sounds, it's got such a negative connotation. But what it really means when you get down to it after years of having that report is, I help people accomplish their goals at the same time that I get mine accomplished. So we both win together. So that's the way I look at yep. it. Yep. Early, early, uh, early in my marriage, I, um, had, uh, I don't know if I, I brought it up to my wife for one of my kids to read or I don't remember what it was, but I, I was telling her about how to win friends and influence people. And that was her response was, it sounds like you're turning into a manipulative jerk. That's what the book is for. It's a manual on how to manipulate people. And so years went by and she finally read the book and she was like, you're just figuring out how to get everybody what they want. It has nothing to do with manipulating. Yeah. It has to do with serving. Yeah. And and if you serve, everybody wins. Yeah, because everybody's everybody everybody needs something, but they all need it in a different way. Or a different exactly. thing, and so you just have to figure yeah. out how to give them what they require yep. in the most expeditious yep. manner possible that helps everybody. Yep. All right, exactly. Let's kill number Preach. seven because we've been <laughs> we've been burning it down, brother. We're already at an hour. Uh, All right, uh, number seven, uh, bonus number seven. Teach. There it is. Mentor. Yep. Give more than you yep. take. Man, that's such yep. good advice. Yep. Uh, I was just having a conversation with a friend of mine about this the other day. Uh, we were trying to figure out what the deal was in our little little rural town with all these uh, with all these kids that just expect everything to be handed to them. Uh, you know, the, the mentality these days is such a taker mentality. Serving others. Yeah. You know, there's there's just this big thing where everybody's uh, got the mentality today that that they should be given everything. And I, I, I suggest that the more people give, uh, the more they'll get, um, true happiness is in serving others. It's not in serving yourself. Um, so, uh, teach mentor and, um, don't limit this to technology. Um, you know, find something else that you might be passionate about and try to try to do that. Um, there, there's so many things that you can do, um, you know, just outside of outside of work, but uh, that's really where true happiness can come from. For sure, yeah. I'm 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 one of those people that I derive pleasure from helping others. You know, I'm like uh, I'm yeah. like Thomas the Tank Engine. I would be a very useful engine, right? That <laughs> that brings me <laughs> happiness to help other people. Sometimes to my detriment, right? When my wife is kind of my litmus test for that sort of thing. So she sort of protects me from being taken advantage of, right? Givers can give until they're completely empty. And so you have to sort of monitor that, right? Like you said, there's a lot of takers yeah. and those people will just take and take. But um, I think once you, once you figure that out and you find limits, I think you're a hundred percent right. Especially I think knowledge, knowledge isn't yours to keep and to hide away, right? It's, it's for us to share. 
um, especially when somebody's receptive and asking for help. You know, I I can't imagine withholding that from people, especially you know younger folks trying to make their way, trying to come up. You know, you shouldn't feel threatened. You should feel honored in those scenarios. I think. Right. And yeah, exactly. Dissemination of information um, one, inside of a job, especially, that just makes you that much more useful. If you're able to train other people and teach other people, it doesn't make you um, a commodity that they can just get rid of. You know, it actually makes you more valuable. It's it's true job security. Yeah. Whoops. Absolutely. Yeah, so it's. It, it's true job security because one of my first experiences in a real IT job was the network administrator um, had this uh, thing about him where he didn't share anything because he considered that job security. Um, within six months, he was gone, and I took over. Um, I didn't know that was coming. I was just hired to, you know, replace people's floppy drives so that you know, the engineers didn't have to spend their time working with, you know, stuff that was yeah. piddly for them. And, uh, yeah, it, it, that attitude of, of uh, stinginess with knowledge will get you nowhere. Yeah. And I think um, it's so funny, yeah. especially when you start surrounding yourself with people that will freely give information like that, how much better your life gets, you know, and how quickly. Yep. I think that d this ties into... Um, what was your one about uh, be humble, having a, a network of peers? I think, you know, surround yourself with those kind of people and you're, uh, you're never wanting for help or information, right? Those people that will freely right. give it. Yep. And I was talking yeah, to like and... Nick Ariolano and he was saying where he is, he's, it's a really rural area. And so they're, he doesn't feel like he has any peers or he's never really met anybody, right. That was free and open to sharing information. And, uh, I mean, that's how he ended up finding the podcast and the brother's wisp and the slack and all that stuff. And, um, he said he jumped at the chance because now he's got this community of people that he can share experiences with or ask questions. And, uh, the internet, it's an amazing, I was talking to somebody the other day. It was at the mom. They were talking, I made a flat earther joke. And uh, I said, you know, that's what I love about the internet is it doesn't matter how edge your belief is, how weird is this thing that you like or believe in, there's 500 other people that feel the exact same way as you and you can find them and you can build a community, right? For good or for bad. If you want to believe there's flat, that's fine. It's not hurting anybody. Do it, right? So right. no matter what you're looking for, the internet is such an amazing place to build a community for. It is. Yep. That's cool. And it somehow Indeed. brought Jim Jones into our lives and onto this podcast. And here you are paying it forward, man. You're, uh, you're, right. you're practicing exactly what you're preaching right here. Cool. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to do so. Yeah, man. I have eaten so much of your day. I really appreciate it, Jim. Um, if by chance somebody wants to get a hold of you on the internet, if you're interested in that, how would you have them do that? Uh, so I'm on LinkedIn. Um, there's a lot of Jim Joneses out there. I'm not the guy that killed a bunch of people. <laughs> there's, well, don't give up there's, yet. There's always there's so many button. jokes. <laughs> That's right. Um, I'm not the rapper. Um, I, uh, I think that I'm on LinkedIn as Jay Jones Jr. Um, anyway, I'm the one in Kansas. Kind of hard to miss. Um, yeah. So LinkedIn's a good place to find me. Uh, Facebook, uh, Jim Jones, JR. Uh, yeah, if anybody wants to hit me up, feel free to. I'm on the Little Brothers uh, Slack, I'm, I'm a lurker there. Um, I throw questions out every now and then and occasionally have the time to read everybody's other stuff. And <laughs> I start to answer and then I, I get distracted with work and I don't go back and finish answering. and. Or the weekends uh, are the you worst. You can hit me up there. And, you leave, yeah. you go do something on the weekend, you come back, it takes you 45 minutes to catch up. Yeah. It does. <laughs> yep. <laughs> all right, Jim. Well, uh, if you guys are listening to this, you made it all the way to the end. Thank you, Jim, for popping on here. If you guys have a list of things that you would love to share with the community, as Jim says, teach, mentor, give more than you take. Jump on here, share your 
share your story, share your information, share your history, let people hear your voice, let them know what you think and feel. Um, if you want to jump into the Slack group, you can go to patreon.com forward slash the brothers wisp, jump on there, join our patron and jump in the Slack. Um, I can't stress how, in, how much that has enriched my life and, uh, how grateful I am for all of you guys, uh, on there, uh, on a regular basis. You guys are pulling me out of the fire, giving me good ideas, um, making me laugh a lot, which I think is great. There's, uh, a lot to be said yeah. for humor in tense situations sometimes. Um, <laughs> so thank you guys. Questions, comments, keep them coming. The tower, and so we'll see you next time. Start searching, shooting up the web and neighborhoods, net surfing. We got horrible jokes. We're loud and annoying, but we're informative facts. We're not disappointing. Just give us a listen. Cause fun is the mission. I'm telling you, you don't know what you are missing. Ideas and some good comedy given. If you missed the show already, don't worry. You're forgiven.